with that, we will begin our sessions for day two in earnest. Dr. Che Jie Chen, former chair of the UN Convention on Biodiversity and chair professor of Ecoscience at Yihua Women's University, will speak about the future of humanity, ecological churn, and the role of intangible cultural heritage for a special lecture. It is a pleasure to meet you all. I know that yesterday you had another session, and I think that the theme for yesterday's session is a very a good segue to my uh, topic today. Right now, uh, humanity around the world is facing a crisis that we've never seen before. This is a completely unprecedented catastrophe of sorts. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the change uh, that we're going to see out of us? We have to pull the uh, wisdom of our ancestors. Uh, specifically, I'm referring to ICH. We have to make use of the uh, wisdom that is found in intangible cultural heritage. And with that in mind, I would like to uh, provide a few brief remarks on that subject. Uh, I'd like to move on to my next uh, slide. Because of COVID-19, We've seen that many people have said that nature is uh, striking back, that this is the attack of uh, nature. However, I uh, don't agree with that because I don't think that nature is angry at us and wants to take revenge out on Homo sapiens. It's not that uh, nature is attacking us because it wants to. It's This is really something that we've already made our bed, it's our own doing pretty much that this is really something that we brought on ourselves. When I look at COVID-19, I don't know how this is going to be interpreted or translated, but I feel that I am really in utter shock. And I say this because if we uh, take a look at this uh, situation that is unfolding around us today, and if we organize the uh, information that we have, it appears that this is likely what have been uh, somebody in, living in Hubei province in uh, China was uh, maybe uh, taking out some of these scales on a pangolin and in that process probably gotten sick. And the same person came to this wet market in Wuhan and met different people, shook their hands, maybe coughed on some people. Some of those people came to Korea, some went to Italy, some went to the US, and uh, some people decided to go to Brazil, uh, the opposite side of the world. And now we are seeing that there are about 1 million people, close to 1 million people who have died because of COVID-19. I don't think that there's been an utter a catastrophe of this scale, uh, such human loss of this scale in our recent memory. And this is also uh, having a huge impact on our economy as well. Uh, I don't think that many Koreans are familiar with this animal, the pangolin, but in the process of uh, getting out some of the scales of the pangolin that somebody was infected with a zoonotic disease, how can this even happen? There is a lot of uh, illegal sale of animals around the world, and I am very concerned. And in fact, the pangolin is one of the most illegally traded animal in the world, because unfortunately, many uh, Chinese people in particular have for a very long time believed that the scales of the pangolin have medicinal uh, properties, that they can heal you and make you stronger. And so they use these scales and grind them into medicinal powder. And so if I say this, I think that many people might find it shocking, but the chemical properties that you find in the scales of the pangolin are uh, the same kinds of uh, properties that you find in our fingernails or in our toenails. In fact, they are almost a complete uh, match. So I feel that maybe we should grind down our fingernails and toenails and give them to the people who want the scales of the pangolin so they would, for the first time, leave the poor animals alone. Within this uh, century, I think that the different viruses and outbreaks include SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19, the coronavirus. These three viruses 
uh, all came from bats, is what people believe. In the case of SARS, uh, the bats moved to civets and moved to us. And in the case of MERS, uh, some people believe that the medium was camel. And now uh, the coronavirus is said to have gone through the pangolin and then transmitted to uh, human beings. That is uh, the belief. Climate change and the depletion of biological resources in this current pandemic, they do have an interconnection. But to explain the clear connection among these three elements is not an easy task. However, I, I do want to stress one thing in particular. It is that bats typically live in tropical climates. Now, these are tropical mammals, in fact. And if we take out uh, the uh, mammals of temperate climates and the hot climates, they are pretty much the same, but in the hotter climates, in the tropical climates, there are so many bats living there. In fact, there are almost very few uh, bats living in temperate zones. But because climate change is leading to an increase in our temperature, uh, many of the zones around the world, many regions around the world are moving closer to a tropical climate. And so bats are seeing that they can migrate to other areas because the other areas are increasing in global temperature. So you would see this widespread migration of bats because of rising global temperatures. And also Korea is being said to be moving into a tropical climate as well. We see there is this a pattern of bat species richness, but at least because many people still live in temperate zones, the physical distance between humans and bats uh, have been wide in the past, but this physical distance is decreasing by the day. So, I'm not saying that people would go to a bat cave every day, but because the increase in human species is also growing rapidly, we are increasing in number and bats are also increasing number. Bats, for their sake, want to just live and rest comfortably in their caves. But because of massive human expansion, the forests are diminishing in size, the woods are diminishing in size, so the bats have nowhere else to go. So the bats are mingling with other wild creatures living in the very decreased uh, size and area of the forest, which are getting closer to humans. So it's just getting easier for these zoonotic diseases to jump to their human hosts. If you were able to imagine yourself as a virus living in a wild animal and somebody keeps pushing against you, somebody is impacting your host, that makes you nervous and uncomfortable. So you, as the virus, would jump to another host. And when that happens, typically, probability-wise, the virus would jump to another host and that other host would be human beings because we are increasing in number and we're spreading out and we keep coming into contact with these wild animals. And we, we keep messing with these wild animals and it's going beyond that. We're doing that in a very organizational way. It's a very structured kind of way that we deal with wild animals. So the viruses that live, the bacteria that live in the wild animals want to move to a different host. And when they do so, it's just probability speaking, they would move to us, to humans. Uh, about 250,000 years ago, human sapiens came about. And for the first 240,000 years, about 95% of, of our existence, human sapiens, we were very minimal. We had very negligible impacts on the world, but over the last 10,000 years, we engaged in an agricultural revolution that later led to an industrial revolution. And just all of a sudden, our size, our sheer size grew in number. So if we can go back to about 10,000 years ago, back then, the homo sapiens, the sheer volume of homo sapiens and the sheer volume of all of our livestock, even if we combine all of that together, the complete biomass of wild animals would be far greater than that. So we would only take up maybe 1% of the entire biomass of all of the species in the world. However, right now, if we would do the same kind of measurement, if we look at the whole biomass, the weight of the whole biomass of the world, then all the livestock, the cows, the pigs, the cattle that we grow 
would take up 96 to 98 percent of the total biomass in the world. So we have seen this complete reversal of the species and the population of the species because we were only one percent or less than one percent and maybe even taken up all of our livestock, that would be two to 3%. But now we together take up 96 to 97% of the biomass. So we see all of these viruses and bacteria that feel they must move to another host. And when they do so, the likelihood is that they will pretty much go to one of the livestock that we uh, raise or to human beings, which is why almost every year over the last few decades, we've seen all of these outbreaks of different viruses and, and bacteria-based uh, diseases, SARS virus, Zika, Ebola, this new COVID-19 virus. All of these different viruses are impacting us and the cycles are getting shorter. If we do not put a stop to human expansion, then the cycles will continue to shrink. And that is the uh, forecast that we can have. It's such a terrible tragedy even now, but imagine that this is going to increase in, in intensity and in frequency. And that is just something we would rather not imagine, which is why so many people are hoping and praying for a vaccine to come any day now. And I also really would like to see a vaccine come to market soon. However, I don't think it's going to be that easy to uh, develop a vaccine. It's just not a simple task. If you look back into, uh, excuse me, if you look back over all of these virus outbreaks, SARS, MERS, Zika, Ebola, AIDS, if you look back over these, all these outbreaks, you would find that there's not a single disease that has seen a virus. We've seen many famous people getting sick. You know, AIDS is something that impacts many uh, celebrities and many famous people. And there's been a lot of efforts made over the last few decades. Even now, we still don't have an AIDS vaccine because it's just so difficult a task. And so only when we create the vaccine, we feel that things would get better, but we couldn't just, we can't just wait for a vaccine to come. It's not very likely and it's not going to be easy, which is a message that I've been saying to some people. And I know that many people did not like what I said. It was controversial coming from a scientist like me, but I have said that we really need to espouse an eco vaccine and a behavior uh, vaccine over a medical chemical vaccine. And you might wonder why I'm talking about this. I think Westerners, uh, people in Western nations are very uncomfortable wearing a face mask. However, if we take a look at the uh, Korean people, uh, we have really been very faithful in our use of face masks. We've been very diligent about washing our hands and engaging in social distancing. And these are some of the things that we can put into action. So when a virus moves from one host to another host, we will be effectively blocking that movement through these activities that we're taking, like washing our hands and wearing our face masks. And when we can all engage in these activities together, we are effectively functioning as a vaccine. But I think that there is something that we can do even deeper, uh, something that we can really do at the source. If we had not messed with pangolins in the first place, then we would not have a COVID-19. So if we can have respect for nature, and preserve nature as it stands and just go about our daily lives with this respect of nature in mind, then our lives all would be so much more beneficial. But all of the resources that we use come from nature. So I guess it's impossible to say that we would not approach or touch nature in any way. It's, however, it's very important for us to not engage in relentless destruction of nature, because if we do so, then going forward, we will continue to see these virus outbreaks. And this is not new. This news is not something that comes as a surprise. We have to protect nature. We have to protect ecology. We have to protect our forest. This is the same message that we heard all the time, but there are only a very few people who are saying this message. Most of the majority of people ignore that message until we are faced with this calamity. I. I talk about eco-protection, ecological uh, protection and conservation and eco-vaccine, they're all the same. 
This is all the same thing. It's the same message. I'm just giving it a new expression, eco-vaccine, because an eco-vaccine or any vaccine is only effective when the entirety of the population takes the vaccine and gets the vaccine shot. So when we see Jane Goodall or David Attenborough or me, uh, just these few scientists out there telling everyone to pay attention, we shouldn't do that. Now, 7.8 billion people, the po entire human population have to engage Engage in uh, nature protection and environment protection, and that can function as a vaccine. So that is what I mean by this expression of an eco vaccine. What I am very grateful of is that Pope Francis in November of last year spoke of uh, ecological sin and he said that this idea of an ecological sin should uh, be considered one of the original sins. And the Catholic uh, community said, why are we adding a new original sin to the list? But Pope Francis said that everything in the world has been created by God. That's according to the uh, Catholic uh, doctrine. So all of the different creatures living on this earth we should live together in harmony. We shouldn't attack or uh, make use of other species because they're weaker than us. That is a terrible crime. That is a terrible sin. And God would not want us to do that. So he insisted that we include ecological sin as one of the original sins uh, within the Catholic doctrine. And just two months after he said that, literally two months later, a COVID-19 outbreak came to pass. If we had only listened uh, to Pope Francis, then maybe we wouldn't be living like this right now. I know this is really... Uh, terrible because this virus, it's invisible to the human eye. We have no idea when it's going to come into our body and attack us and even kill us. And we are living with this fear every day. But when I say this, I think that this might come as more of a confusion and chaos to you. But I can tell you that the virus cannot drive us to extinction. The virus will stop on its own once it has killed enough people. That is the truth. When we think of the Black Plague, the pest only killed about one third of the European population. The two thirds, the remaining population, because there were so few people in Europe, there was natural social distancing. So the virus couldn't jump to another host. So the virus cannot drive us to extinction. However, the climate crisis can. The climate crisis is different. The climate crisis will find each and every one of us and kill every last human being on Earth. This is something that could drive us to extinction. So I know that we feel we look at COVID-19 and we're concerned about what's going to happen to the fate of humanity. But really, let's take this opportunity to think about climate crisis. We have to completely rethink climate crisis because it's only going to get worse. And we have to put into action what we need to do and solve uh, this problem. This is really the time that we must act. I know that we've heard about many of these millionaires and billionaires around the world. When the virus outbreak came to pass, they hopped on their yachts and just ship shipped out to the uh, far sea, believing that they would be safe out in the oceans. They thought that uh, the, maybe the outbreak will end about 10 days, 12 days, but, you know, it didn't stop after 10 days. So what, these billionaires are not used to fishing and you know scaling the fish and cleaning the fish on their own. So after a few days out at sea, they need to bring in their cooks. They need to bring in their, their chefs and their maids. There's You cannot hide in the face of a virus. There's just no way. All of the people across all of the different uh, strata of society have learned a lesson. If you are rich, and within, you're living in a capitalist society, you've had a very long time where you thought that you'd be fine if you just survived on your own. But through this crisis, we all came upon this realization that you cannot be the only one to survive. We've looked at the vulnerable members of our society 
everyone has to be happy. Everyone has to be safe and free from the virus for us all to be safe. That is the only way for a society to be safe overall. Singapore has been very excellent in terms of disease control, just like Korea, uh, but because of the uh, vulnerable working conditions that migrant workers are exposed to, there was a resurgence of COVID-19. Oh, this is a sort of a new awakening to everyone in society. I know that we're all familiar with this African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. I think that through this current COVID-19 outbreak, I think really a lot of people were able to realize the truth behind this proverb because there's no, really no way for you to go far if you go by yourself. You cannot survive on your own. Through this outbreak, uh, the people around the world have often come to terms with the expression solidarity. This is becoming a key word for all of us. We have to hold hands and go together into the future. And many people have finally come upon this realization uh, thanks to COVID-19. I work at, in biodiversity and IPCC, International Organization, Organization is working in the field of uh, climate change. In 2013, IPBES, an international organization, was founded by some like-minded people. And in this international organization of biodiversity, they established a three task forces. And what I found to be very amazing is that they use uh, traditional data and uh, some of the task forces make use of that. But one of the task forces here looks at traditional knowledge and the different worldwide traditional knowledge and know-how that have been used throughout history for environmental protection. So I, I thought that was really encouraging. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because biologists like myself, we know that the traditional communities have this uh, great awareness of mother nature. And I think that that recognition of nature is way beyond what our current thinking of nature is. However, this uh, awareness of traditional communities on how they kept up uh, biodiversity and lived together with nature, this idea and the spirit of coexistence has always consistently been founded on uh, solidarity, on the spirit of solidarity. If you look at any of these ethnic and uh, traditional communities around the world who honor and respect nature, they've always emphasized solidarity. So through this COVID-19 outbreak, we have to realize that we're humans, we have to work and live together. We have to go together. And based on this realization, we have to harness this uh, knowledge and these different know-how and the exp expertise that we have accumulated throughout our history, especially the ones that exist in our traditional communities, especially when it comes to intangible cultural heritage. They can give us answers for us uh, to uh, go into the future. Humanity has faced transitions uh, across all of our history. This is what sociologists often mention. It's the uh, turn. There's a linguistic turn where we've uh, seen this turn in our language. And there's cultural turn where we've seen this rapid shift in our culture. Over the last few decades, we've seen information turn, technological turn, these different uh, expressions that have come out about 20 years ago or so. Rather than these different turns, I felt that the most important and the most urgent turn is an ecological turn. I have consistently made this argument. We call ourselves Homo sapiens. That's a current species. Sapiens in English means wise. So basically, we are calling ourselves wise as a species. But if we were really wise, then we would not have done this to our surrounding environments. We should have been more prudent. We have completely taken for granted our surroundings 
and we've laid waste to utter destruction. That's why we are living as we are right now. So we want to take this opportunity and go beyond homo sapiens. Instead of calling ourselves wise and smart, we have to try to think in terms of coexistence, where we would live in harmony with the rest of the biomass. So we should call ourselves homo symbius. Homo symbius means that we would live in symbiosis together uh, with the species around the world. I know that uh, many other experts have uh, said as much, uh, but not many people have listened to their words. But recently, I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Jane Goodall, and we both came to an agreement that maybe we could not do this, but this invisible virus is able to do what we cannot do. Through this uh, catastrophe, I was able to see the people around me, and I was able to see that many people who don't usually care about environmental concerns have come to the realization that, oh my goodness, things will be really bad for us if we continue down this path. We have to change. So I think that we might be there. We might have uh, increased that level of awareness uh, for the people around the world. But now we have to go a little bit further and translate that into action. So that is the next step. And I believe that wisdom, uh, much of that wisdom, can be found in the intangible cultural heritage that have been passed down across generations, which is why I, I anticipate much from your work. Thank you very much for your attention.